estimation of software development time misses the mark all the time. As an industry, we know we are bad at this. I don't like estimations, and I believe we shouldn't be estimating in time at all. But they do have a place in software delivery. Our managers and our clients continuously have questions like, is it worth spending time of this? Or can I afford this? Which in turn always becomes a question for us software developers. How much time will it take? High level roadmaps need to be filled, sprints need to be committed to, but with how much? What can we actually do and how much time? So how should we approach estimations or should we avoid them completely? To explain why we're bad at this, I'll talk about our cognitive biases and the nature of software development. Then I have five best practices to deal with estimations. Let's get into it. There's three cognitive biases I could find which are relevant to software estimations, but there's probably more. Number one is that we tend to overestimate our own ability, our own competence at a certain task. This is called the Dunning-Kruger effect. This yields lower numbers when estimating time. The second one is that we tend to give desirable answers. We tell people what they want to hear. This is called the social desirability bias. This also leads to lower numbers when it comes to time estimation. To counter this, there's the underpromise and overdeliver advice that I hear often, but only helps us so much because it doesn't solve the root cause of the problem. And the third one is Parkinson's law, which states that work expands to fill the time we allocate to it. The data shows we almost always underestimate, but even if we would overestimate, Parkinson's law says we would fill this time anyway. I believe often when you think you are right with your estimation, you completed the project in time, everything is fine, even then actually you, are, you overestimate it and Parkinson's law is at work. So our biology is against us and we know this. Software projects overrun all the time. Data has shown we're off by a factor of four on average. And managers and sales departments and often clients know this as well. They're, they're known to add a factor to what a software developer estimates. They don't trust us either. And uh, it's not us, it's humans in general. We shouldn't trust estimations at all. The word estimate means nothing to me anymore. It's merely a guess, maybe not even that. Software development is exploration. It is figuring out where you need to go. It is not execution. We're not factory workers that have already built 1500 of these exact model cars and we're just gonna build the next one, which is going to be exactly the same. That's not software development. Every time we're figuring out a new problem. So we need a sort of R&D process where we are allowed to fail and allowed to figure out the design on the go. This one's failing, let's build another one, slightly different. Okay, this one's better but it's still not solving that. Okay, let's throw that away and let's build this one. That is more what software design, software development is. I'll be talking about design as in solution design. So which classes do I have, which files, which functions, how do they couple together? What is the separation of concern? That is what I'll call design in this video. I don't mean UX design. When we take a step back and look at the history of software development processes, we now have extreme programming and agile and DevOps, which are modern ways of working. Before that, we were basically what we now call doing waterfall. We were trying to fix the solution design. We were trying to fix the time and we're trying to fix the scope. What are you exactly building in terms of features? In how much time are you building that? And how are you going to solve the problems that you'll run into? And all of this got this one price tag and we, we sold it either to a manager or to a client. It turns out you cannot fix time and scope and solutions. You need to pick one. And Scrum and Agile were the first to do, and, and before that extreme programming actually already, were the first to say like, you cannot fix them both. You need to pick one. If you are going to have a fixed scope, so an exact feature set you're going to build, then you need to be able to take a lot of time to do that or a very little time, but it needs to be flexible. The moment you set a deadline, you will run into problems because then you will have to rely on estimation again. You can also do it the other way around, which is what Scrum does, fixed time. Namely, we have a set of sprints and they all end at a specific time that we have agreed to and then we'll figure out the scope as we go but then your scope has to be fluid yes you want sort of this feature will promise to add that value but maybe in a different way let's talk about the problem you're having and not about the solution you want me to design it's again not estimation it's a different way of approaching things waterfall failed for mainly two reasons scope changes all the time and software development is exploration and not execution 
to build high quality software, we need to be able to figure out on the go where we are actually going. And not in terms of the feature or the value we're delivering, that should be clear before you start, but in terms of what our solution direction will look like. What will the separation of concerns be? How should we fix this in our current microservice landscape? What is the coupling going to be? What technology do we even, there's, there's many, many decisions that we need to make to figure out how we are going to deliver that value. So again, it's exploration. And in the past, as a result of us not understanding this time versus scope thing, waterfall projects either overran in terms of deadline because we had to make the scope or we didn't make the scope and we, we had to make the deadline. So we delivered less or more or whatever. The, the scope was changeable. And that's in the end the choice that needs to be made. And Scrum and Agile tries to make this choice. It says time is the thing we can fix. You get what you want in time, but what is vaguely defined so that we can figure out where we are going on the go. Best practice number one is break it down. Instead of estimating time, we should be figuring out how to split up the work into different parts of reasonable size. Smaller is better here because the sooner we can deliver value, the quicker we can have our manager or our client just trust us with the task without asking for an estimation because we've delivered, delivered value so quickly in the past. Just, just go run with it. I'll trust you. That's the kind of situation where we want to be in. But if you're in a situation where estimating time really is the only option moving forward, you just have to answer that question, then your approach to it should be to not answer this as a whole thing. You should be splitting it up and coming up with estimations, smaller estimations for the different components. You will be wrong. This estimation, whether you do it on a large scale or in a smaller scale, you will be wrong because of all the reasons I've just discussed. So never give the impression that you're right. Always say, I'd rather not estimate this. I don't have a clue. This is not the nature of software development. You don't want to be annoying at it, but you do have to be realistic. This is not an estimate. This That, that implies some security. I will never call it a estimate. I will always call it a guess in that sense. In a positive way, you should be opposed to coming up with a design, a solution design up front. Again, software development is exploration. You cannot come up with all the designs that you need to do right now while making the estimation. That's not how it works. Even if you do, you will make mistakes. When approaching this kind of thing, ask a lot of questions. Make sure you are very explicit about the assumptions you're making. State them, write them down. Say, okay, to move forward, to even give you this number, I need to say this and this and this as an assumption. We have to solve it in this and this way. But realize the moment you say these kind of things, you now have a solution direction you need to following. You need to follow when executing this because otherwise you will not make this estimation, which often turns into a deadline. And that's, that's the tricky part of this. Also make sure you explicitly take things into account that are meetings, coffee breaks, testing, deployment, whatever you have going on in your process that actively takes time. That, that should be part of your estimation now. And again, don't give one number, give a, a whole sheet or a, a list of estimations with many numbers and, and their components. And in addition, give a certainty percentage to it. Like this component, I don't have a clue. I, let's, let's quadruple the number I came up with because this doesn't make sense to me. We have to really do design. The only way to figure it out is to actually do the work. That's the nature of software development. You have to keep stating that these things, these solutions will only be figured out while doing the work. So if something is really unclear to you, add a percentage, like I am 0% sure of this. Uh, for other things that you may have done repeatedly already, you may have a higher percentage of uh, certainty, but it's very important to state I'm really sure about this. I don't have a clue about that. That's the kind of granularity that makes sense that clients, managers, sales departments actually need to be able to do their job. My second best practice is if you don't know how much work something will be, don't answer the question. When somebody asks you for an estimation, don't try to come up with a number at all costs because it won't make sense. This may be my most important advice in this whole video. If there's only one thing to take away, don't give a number if you're not behind the number, if you don't know exactly, okay, this is, this is making some form of sense to me. I can now say this for some businesses. It may be very hard to give some pressure back to you having to come up with an estimation. 
Given how some businesses work, it may be very difficult to not answer this question. But you have to try, because otherwise you're creating a false expectation. Your reputation is, is on the line. Your, your reputation will be hurt and the business will be hurt if you just come up with a random number that you're not really sure about. Instead, if you don't know how to solve something, you need to start solving it. So the approach would be, can we have a discovery phase? Can we have an investigation user story? Can we have a spike? Can we, can we start the work already? If all of this for me is the same thing. It's we need to start the work to figure out where we need to go because we don't have a clue until we actually start doing things. This is the nature of software development. I can't make it up right now. I need to learn this on the go. Together with your product owner, you should start to figure out what the scope actually looks like. Is there something that is really core, really important in the feature or whatever you're building? Is there something secondary? Is there parts that are very trivial? And this already starts to look like something that you now have some wiggle room in the scope. Now you can maybe try and, and negotiate on, okay, so let's pick a time frame that makes sense to all of us. Can we have some wiggle room in the scope? Then we can actually commit to it, but you can't have both. I cannot come up with a number now that contains a solution design that I have no clue about if we don't have any, any wiggle room here. My third best practice is to estimate complexity or difficulty points instead of time. This is especially good when you're doing something like Scrum or Kanban, when you're doing an in-sprint estimation. The rest of the world doesn't have to see this. Anybody outside of your team it's not really relevant how you estimate this, it's just for the team itself. It's good to stick to something like t-shirt sizes or Fibonacci scale because it reflects the lack of precision that you're dealing with. You just wanna get a feeling for how much of this stuff you can fit in a sprint and that's really enough because the less estimation you do, the more freedom you have to pick high quality solution direction. And that is really what you, what we should be focusing at, what we're optimizing for, delivering value, doing it quicker and being honest about, we want to give you a high quality of code as well, so that in the future, it is still code that is changeable and we can keep giving you high value. If we don't focus on high quality code right now, we lose that high quality in the future and we won't be able to deliver value anymore. These story points or complexity points or difficulty points or whatever you want to call them, they work because you're not exactly committing to a solution, you're committing to the scope of a problem. And this is why Scrum works as well. If you only specify your, your problem in your user story and your product owner is really good at specifying problems and what the business value is and what the client or the user value is, then you can really pick the solution you need on the go. And the estimation of the difficulty or the complexity point is then not focused on the solution, but only on the problem statement, which implies a certain complexity in itself already. And that's a lot of information that you just have to deal with. If I need to deliver this value, I need to solve this problem. How I can solve it, I will figure this out during the sprint. That's something you can work with. My last best practice is to not estimate at all when you can. This is especially useful when you're dealing with, for example, a long-term roadmap where a vague estimation is already accepted the further it is in the future. That is a situation where you can, instead of coming up with an estimation, it is so far off your current software state, instead try to forecast and based on past data. Yeah, try to have the team together that will actually build this feature, then ask them, when presented this new business value or feature or whatever, what are similar things we have done in the past? Can we look at our data from the last year or two years? Can we pick something that is very similar in size and compare them and then see if we can come up with an estimation this way? That does require this data to be available from the past. You need to have measured this data. You need to know this feature cost me so much time. Now, when the team is looking at another feature that will do in the future, let's look at which is similar and they're not going to be exactly the same because then we would reuse that code and the estimation would be a lot smaller. No, instead we're building something similar, but it is different. So what are the differences? Why do we think this is similar? Let's focus on these differences. Let's add or subtract based on these things. To summarize, the nature of software development doesn't connect with an environment that demands to know from us how long exactly will something take. In this video, I try to explain the complex landscape we have to navigate when dealing with estimations. I hope I've 
actually helped you understand this, this landscape a bit better. And I hope my tips were actually usable. Let me know what you think in the comments. If you have any other thoughts or if you'd like me to make a specific video in the future, leave a comment and subscribe. Thank you very much for watching.